Hello everybody and welcome to another Andy's Workshop instructional video. In this, in this video we're going to perform a bit of a ghetto modification to this development board. This board, as, you, as many of you will recognise, is the STM32F4 Discovery Board. It's got an STM32F407 um, MCU on board running at 168 MHz. Now the MCU is clocked by this, this oscillator that you can see here. It's an 8 MHz device and its um, capacitive load is, give, is uh, given by these capacitors here. You can just see on the edge. Let's get really close in so you can see a close-up. That's the 8 meg oscillator and those are its load capacitors there. Now the aim of this video will be to replace this oscillator with a 25 megahertz unit. Now the reason why you might want to do this is, is particularly if you're working with um, Ethernet, Ethernet PHYs because um, the the uh, MCU here is capable of outputting um, an MCO clock, which is the master clock out, at 25 megahertz if you've got a 25 megahertz crystal. Now, um, just about every PH white I've ever seen uh, requires a 25 megahertz oscillator input. And you can usually supply those uh, by fitting a 25 meg oscillator on the board itself or next to the PHY. Or to save on your bill of materials cost, you can clock out, you can use the MCO output from this MCU and direct it straight into the PHY. And that's the reason why I'm going to show you how we're going to be replacing this um, crystal and these two caps here with um, replacement devices. So let's take a quick look at the replacement crystal that I'm going to use. Here they are. I hold them close enough. You should, the camera should focus. Yes, they do. You can see they're stamped there with 25m as the uh, as the as the speed rating, which is 25 megahertz. Um, and they, they come in the HC49 leaded package. Now the, um, the alternative is surface mount, of course. But if I just grab hold of the um, discovery board here, we can see that this is a through hole component. So now there's there's the oscillator again. And if I flip the board over. We can see down here that's where it comes through to the other side. So we're definitely looking at a through hole component, and the HC49 package that I've uh, got there will work fine. Now, if we just take a look at the specification for the crystal I'm going to use, then you'll see why I actually need to replace the load capacitors on the F4 as well. So here we see that this, this particular crystal requires a load capacitance of 18 picofarads. And I've used this crystal before, so I know, I know that the correct um, load capacitance for it is a pair of 30 picofarads um, on the board. Um, and if I look at the uh, schematic for the um, ST Discovery board, I can see that they've used 20 picofarad um, capacitors as the, as the uh, load providing capacitors for the crystal. So I'm going to have to remove those 20s and replace them with a pair of 30s of my own. Now moving back to the board, I can see I'm going to have to develop a plan for getting this thing off without damaging the rest of the board. Now the load caps that we can see are actually very close to the oscillator. They are right there and right there. So I think it's probably best that I take the oscillator off first to give myself a bit of working room around here. Now I plan to do that by using my hot air gun to melt these two joints here that are holding it in and hopefully I'll be able to grasp the other side of the crystal and just yank it out when these two joints melt. With the oscillator out of the way I should be able to flip the board over back to this side and just grab hold of these two with tweezers and again use hot air to just lift them off the board. I don't envisage much of a problem there and then after cleaning up the board I should be able to just insert the new crystals and the, the new capacitor and we should be good to go. So now I'm ready to um, begin the process of removing the crystal from the board. Now the first thing we're going to do is we're going to clean it. Clean the contacts with a little bit of IPA, isopropyl, isopropyl alcohol, and we'll be able to say that. Just give the pads a bit of a dab here, just to, just to remove any crustiness that may have developed over time. IPA is available in all kinds of guises. You can find it marketed as PCB cleaner, camera lens cleaner, as long as you get 90 plus percent pure, then it's good for this purpose. There, I can see it's uh, it's nice and clean now. I'll just dab that dry. Right, the next step is to apply a little bit of flux. Let's get something I can use to place a little piece of flux on here. I'm hoping that the flux will cause the solder to wick to the edges of the of the holes here. 
and leave and when the crystal drops out the, the, the holes will be immediately usable again uh, for the, inserting the new crystal without me having to clean up but I <laughs> think that may be more than hope uh, we'll see whether that works okay so now the uh, contact the pads are prepared uh, and ready for me to apply heat and hopefully get the thing out now in order to remove it I'm going to be using my hot air gun yeah, you can see it there it's a however you pronounce that 852A plus and I find this extremely useful I couldn't do without it for reflow work I highly recommend that anybody doing surface mount work gets a hot air gun of some sort actually let's get back here so you can see me turn it on so let's switch it um, onto hot air mode the compressor starts and a little ball up there just to prove the fact there's a compressor going uh, right now I always use the temperature of 380 let's get it up there 360 70 80 and I use the default airflow uh, speed of 51 whatever that means uh, when the A comes on it's ready to go now 380 of course is measured at the um, the heating element inside inside the hot air gun here but it's, and the temperature outside is considerably less uh, no, I shouldn't do that too often that will hurt I'm going to use the smallest nozzle available um, so I can get some directed heat onto those pads okay Right, now my first attempt at this, I'm, ouch, I just touched the barrel of the hot air gun. Don't do that, it's not clever. Um, I'm gonna direct the air directly at these pads and I'm hoping that the weight of the crystal on the other side of the board there is just gonna make it fall out when the two uh, blobs of solder melt. That may not work and I may have to come back and grab it in some kind of other arrangement later, but I'm gonna try this first. So let's get the hot air in there and evenly apply heat to those pads. Just waving left and right. The flux has long since melted. Oh, I think I can see it going down. Oh, I see an illusion. Come on. Give it a poke. No, nope, that didn't help. It's not going to go, I don't think. I think it's gripped too hard. Maybe um, maybe the crystal itself, the base of it, has got itself tacked to the board somehow. Oh no, there it goes. It's just fell through. i take that back. It hasn't come out all the way out, but it will make it a lot easier for me to get a hold of it from either side. Right, let's take the heat off for a second and have a look where we are. Oh yeah, nearly out. One pin is complete completely out as you can see there let's do it around see one pin has completely come out and the other pin is nearly out so if I just apply some heat to the one remaining hole which should be able to get this thing out where are we Bit of burnt flux on the board there so that's the one remaining hole come on Oh, it really doesn't want to come out of this side. Got it. No, you didn't see that. That was me yanking it out. I apologise for not showing that under the camera. But now you can see that uh, it's out. I managed to pull it out with my fingers uh, very quickly because, of course, it is really hot. Now let's move on. With the crystal out of the way, let's move on to just picking out the uh, those two caps that I'm going to need to replace. Um, I'm going to have to turn the board around here so I can get in to grasp them better. Now for this kind of job you really really need a pair of needle nose tweezers like this, the, the um, angle tweezers, they are absolutely fantastic, I would not give these up for anything. They're really cheap as well, just, just get yourself a pair. Right, now we just get hold of that, the row 603s, easy to get hold of. These will just fall off, and there we go, that's one. Get it off the tip of the tweezer so I can come back, back under the camera, and the other one. There, easy. Now let's switch the hot air gun off because I'm done with that for now. One good thing I'll show you this is actually happening. One good thing about this particular model of uh, model of uh, hot air gun is that when you I'll stop this thing vibrating so you can hear it, let's place the iron back on. Zoom out a bit. 
when I switch it uh, to, uh, it's currently on the reworking setting here, if I switch it to cool down, then it will go to maximum airflow with the elements off and it'll wait until this uh, heater comes down to below, I think it's below 100 or below 90 and then it'll switch itself off. That just extends the light of life of the heating element, otherwise you could go through these things pretty quickly. I've gone through one heating element uh, in, a, in about a year of use um, and I have a couple of others on the shelf ready for backup. Always make sure if you do buy a hot air gun that heating element replacements are available because you will go through them. So you can see it's cooling down fairly quickly. I'll just let it run through and you can see when it drops to below, uh, well, I think it's about 90, it'll just shut itself down. Noisy old thing, I've got it on, on uh, rubber stands and uh, props it with bits of uh, wadded paper there to try and keep the thing quiet. The compressor really does create quite a lot of vibrations. And we're almost down. 96, 93, ping, there it goes, great stuff. And we'll switch off. So let's now come back to the board and see what state we've got it's in at the moment. Now I know that obviously the way the caps were, it's gonna be easy to, to reflow those uh, pads again after I've just cleaned them up and applied some more flux. But I think we have a problem with the holes. Yeah, if we see where the holes where the crystal um, was it was inserted if you can see that on the video I'm not sure whether it'll show up there's still some solder gobs in there it's, it's blocked up I won't be able to just insert a new crystal in there I mean I could actually hold the crystal against the solder while I melt it from the side and just push it through I may actually do that it's not a particularly pleasant way of working but it will get the thing in um, let's have a look at the other side just some burnt flux around the around the holes that's not a problem um, let's have a look. Yeah, I think it's going to be easier to just uh, push the crystal through while while it's heated because it's going to be easier. Um, the alternative, of course, is to try and wick up some solder there with some solder wick and see if I can get those holes clear. But I think I just might make a bit more mess doing that. Okay, let's move on to the um, second stage then. Right, so I'm ready now to uh, try and insert the new crystal into the modified board. So I've got it here, 25 megahertz. Um, crystal requiring 18 picofarads of load. Now the plan is to is for me to hold the crystal against these two holes here. This is a bit of a hack really. Hold it like that while reheating the other side here and hopefully with a, the little pressure on the that I'm creating here with my finger the little pressure will be able to push it through when those two holes melt. I'm hoping that'll happen before my finger starts burning on the other side. I will soon find out. So it's back to the hot air gun. I'll switch it back on again. Go on the rework setting. And it's warmed up right, so here goes nothing. Either this is going to burn my finger or it's going to, it's going to work brilliantly. So let's, let's get heating. Normally doesn't take long to melt these things. Yeah, now my hand's starting to shake with the unnatural position that I'm in, which is not helpful. I can just have, can I feel it? No, not yet. Oh yeah, I can feel it coming through. Excellent. So I can feel the top one there. So I need to apply a bit more heat to this bottom one to get it to match. Yeah, I can feel that one going as well. Excellent, so I'll just pause. We'll have a look at the other side, because yeah, now the crystal is able to support itself, I can turn it over and get a better, a better hold. Now I know the crystal isn't likely to drop out. And of course this board is hot. Let's continue. And my thumb is starting to get hot. Let's move back a little bit. Oh yeah, it's coming through on the top there. And let's do the bottom one. That one's also, yeah, we're, we're all the way through now. Let's have a look. Yep, yeah, it's sat down perfectly. 
Now you may have noticed the little plastic uh, shield on the bottom of the crystal there. I'd never seen those before. Crystals don't normally come with those. I actually discovered it stuck to the bottom of the of ST's 8 MHz crystal when I took it off. I suppose it allows for a trace routing underneath the crystal without causing shorts. I looked on the board and, and I didn't see any traces running underneath it that could have been a problem. But I decided to keep that little shield anyway. It's a nice little touch. And there we go. Now, of course, I'm not going to leave it like that. I'm going to apply some more solder with a proper iron. Let's um, return to this other side. Okay, now the next step is going to be to add the uh, two 30 picofarad capacitors back in place, which I actually need uh, for this new, this new uh, crystal loading. Right, so I'm now ready to uh, reflow the two um, 30 picofarad 0603 capacitors into place. So I'm going to need to provide the load capacitors for this for this new crystal. Now, while while uh, you were away in the interval there, I applied a bit more solder to the, um, the pads where the um, crystal where the where the capacitors are going to go, just so that they'll uh, reflow comfortably and have a good join. Now, of course, I should have done this before putting the crystal on, but hey, that was um, it's too late now. So I'll just hold the cap in place while applying hot air. And it sits down nicely. Let's just hold that. Remove smoking flux. And that's down. Okay, let's get the other one. I'm just picking it up off, off camera here and placing it on the board. More heat to those pads, of course, because they're so small, they melt really quickly and it's in place. There we go. Often if I don't get, get them down fully first time I'll just hold them on top they're gently there with the with the tweezers and then reflow again until they sit down properly. But these look these look good. I'll inspect them under the microscope but I think I can see good joins there. Now on the other side of the board we have the pin sticking out where the where the crystal was um, reflowed into place. Now you can see it. So what I'm going to do is just um, apply some more solder just to give that a good joint. Reaching over for my for my soldering iron here. This is a fairly generic um, soldering iron that you can get uh, on Amazon, but I, I've actually replaced the rubbish tips that come with it with some decent hacko tips. Um, okay, so I've already applied flux to this. And let's just. Uh, Heat, apply solder, in it goes. And the other one. Heat, apply solder, and it's set. Can't beat Hakko tips, really, they are excellent. Let's have a look. Looks pretty good to me. I'm just going to trim those off now. Trim those uh, spare leaves off, you know, so you're not going to leave those sticking out. And give the board a quick clean, and then we should be ready for testing. Excellent. Now, before we can finally declare victory in this modification, there's one last change that we need to make. We need to remove R68, shown here, which is a kind of a bridging 100 ohm resistor between um, the master clock out of the um, ST-Link device on here and the clock input of the um, STM32F4. Now the reason why ST have bridged these two together is so that the clock input can be taken from the ST link instead of from the onboard crystal. We don't want that um, because that, that clock coming out of the um, ST link is always 8 megahertz and we want our 25 to be used. So we're going to remove this resistor here as per the instructions in their schematic. Once again I'm going to be using hot air to do this which is definitely the easiest way. So I'll bring in my hot air gun, turn it up you can't see, I'm turning it up now to the temperature of 380 degrees, so it's ready to remove uh, pieces from the board. It's now reached the operating temperature, so I just have to apply the hot air while gripping the resistor, and it should just lift straight off the board. There we go, really easy. And that's the last of the configuration changes that we need to make to this board. Um, I've made one optional change, which so I'll just show you. If we switch over here, I made this um, offline. I don't want to bore you with all this me soldering for hours. I've replaced R24, which is one of the 
put this out of the way here. It's one of the resistors, the zero ohm resistors here, R25. There was a 220 ohm resistor here, R24, which is in series with the crystal output. Um, I have no need for a series resistor with this particular crystal, so I removed R24, the 220 ohm resistor, and I replaced it with a, a simple bridging, um, bridging zero ohm resistor, just like R25. So now this crystal is connected directly to the um, to the STM32 and has the correct um, load capacitors over here. So that's it. We should be done now. It's ready to test. Now the simplest of all tests is just a quick and dirty blink, the blinker led at one hertz test, um, basically uh, the, you know, the blink test that you get with um, any micro just to make sure that the thing's working. Um, now the idea with the STM32 is that you, um, you use the system um, SysTick timer which is one of the core peripherals on, uh, on the ARM Cortex uh, devices. And you, you set it up with an assumption that it's going to tick at one millisecond and then you just set a delay um, to wait for a thousand milliseconds, turn an LED off, uh, wait another thousand milliseconds, turn the LED on and so on infinitely. And that's what I've done here with this. And you can just see, just as a quick and dirty example, have I got the right frequency? Because all of the clock setup that I've done assumes that it's got an input of 25 megahertz coming in. And if I'd got any of that wrong, then, this, then the end result would be that this would just not, not uh, just go on and off at um, you know, one hertz, it would be some way off. Um, obviously I can't do you know, nanosecond level tests to make sure I've got everything right here, but I can see quickly that I am ticking at my, somewhere near my assumed uh, input of 25 megahertz, maybe spot on, at this point I don't know. To do um, a precise test, I would, I would generate um, you know, a higher frequency clock and I'd put it to a GPIO pin where I'd sample it with my um, logic analyzer. My logic analyzer runs at one giga samples per second, so I can, I can perform very accurate uh, samples to make sure that the clock is, is working as, as it should. And I'll do that, but now I know that um, based on this quick and dirty test, that we, you can see the source code here, at the edge of the screen, um, pause it if you want to see more. Um, then what, what, I, what I can see from this is that I am in the right ballpark and it is safe to move on to do further testing. I think this, uh, the hardware modification basically has worked and I can move on and see uh, just, just to make sure that I'm, I'm really accurate as well. Okay, um, I think that brings me to the end now of the, uh, the video part of this presentation. Please do visit the blog if you're planning on doing this, um, this modification yourself. And you can see a write-up with more photographs as well and, and all the source code to any of the examples that I've used here to do the tests. Thank you and goodbye.